Hi, I'm Dan Frischman. I have been a magician, a stand-up comic, a writer, and an actor on many shows. Now I've become something completely different. A senior citizen. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of senior life. We'll cover health, hobbies, and major topics like, where did I put my keys? Oh. Come along as I make my way to the head of the senior class. Do you see those happy smiling faces gathered round the band? I'm telling you they're listening to the music of Ragtime Dan. One of the wonderful things about senior life is having time for hobbies. I enjoy collecting antique phonographs. I certainly get my fix of them, but when I need one fixed, I go to Scott Corbett. Not only does he repair them, but he and his wife Denise own the Edison Phonograph Museum on their property in the Los Angeles area. And for the record, it's pretty amazing. So Scott, thanks to my hobby, I found you and learned about your hobby, which is collecting a wide variety of memorabilia. I'd love to know, how did the two of you form this hobby right here in your living room? Well, <laughs> we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. He asked me, someday when you have your own house, how would you want to decorate? I said, well, I definitely want antiques, but I wouldn't want it to be a museum. Oh, well. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I got the museum, and, and, and I couldn't be happier. So you raised two daughters in this house. What did they think of your unique hobby? When they hit high school, which is usually when they disown you as an adult, <laughs> they actually would invite their friends over, and their friends would come here, and I mean, that's very vulnerable. You have nerdy parents, you know, but they really liked it. All the kids liked it. So you are both retired school teachers, yes? We are. I taught special needs preschool. Oh. And Scott. mine was mostly fourth grade. Oh, wow. Well, well. and, and, and Denise, you still do presentations for kids uh, about dinosaurs? I do. I actually have a fossil collection and I bring a lot of my fossils into the classroom. So the kids, I mean, what preschooler doesn't love? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, yeah. And so they get to touch yeah. them and hold them. And, yeah. and you have something to show us. I do. Denise, we're here in your dining room. What are we looking at? This is my fossil collection. This is one of my, my favorite pieces. Scott got me this for our anniversary. This is a baby mosasaur. So a mosasaur was a creature that lived in the ocean, in the Sahara Ocean, um, which is now the Sahara Desert. And that's a baby. Yeah. You are a good little mosasaur. Yes, you yeah. are. But if you look at this, this is an adult mosasaur. So wow. these two teeth right here right, are, those are these. Teeth. Okay. I wouldn't want to meet either of these in a dark alley or, or an even open space. Open, f no. <laughs> no. The Corbett's have so many unique items inside their home, I couldn't wait to see what was out back in the museum. On the way, I found something incredible in the backyard. My goodness, look at this. This is what's left of a 1917 Ford Model T. Something that looks like Lauren Hardy would have driven. Where did you get it? It was just uh, four miles from here at an antique mall. Okay. And I, I fell in love with it right away. And well, a thousand bucks was good for me. So okay. uh, we, we had to take out the fence and roll it in here. And here it stays. Well, I'd be willing to bet that Henry Ford had no idea that he was building the world's most unique planter. <laughs> so Scott, you built this museum, you've got a hundred phonographs, 10,000 records, but it's more than a collection. It's a, it's a family history, right? What's your connection to Thomas Edison? Well, I had collected for about 15 years, and then I had another passion, which was genealogy. And I'd been working on it one day, and all of a sudden I see Thomas Edison and his father Samuel and his grandfather Samuel. It's like, wait a minute. John Edison, his great-grandfather, uh, was the first to come to the United States about 1740. Edison was uh, a loyalist, and when the Revolutionary War broke out, they caught Edison and his friends spying on Washington's troops. So they executed his friends, but he was spared because he had married into my family, which were the Ogdens, okay. and they were a patriot family that had already been here for 150 years. 
the line goes that we're cousins. And so down here is the brains and the money, and I'm over here. <laughs> Not one of the most unique items in your collection is a recording of a statement made by Ronald Reagan before he became president. Yes. This was made at the time he was governor of the state of California. And it is an emergency broadcast record that would only go out under very specific circumstances. Can you play it for us? We can. This is Governor Ronald Reagan. Our military authorities are expecting an attack by enemy forces. Public warning devices have been sounded. This is not a test. Well, that's pretty chilling. Yeah, it is. You know, I used to do an impression of Ronald Reagan in my stand-up act from his debate with Jimmy Carter. You want to hear it? Of course. <clears throat> there you go again. Okay, that killed 35 years ago. Scott, in addition to these phonographs, you also collect what we might call Americana. Mm -hmm. now, what is this? This is a glob top bottle uh, issued by the um, Biedenhorn Candy Company. It's like many other of its type, but this was the first one to hold Coca-Cola. And they could not keep carbonation in the bottle until they came up with this bottle design. And they had a pull top which had a rubber gasket so they would fill it and they would put it down and then seal it. And then when the person went to drink it, pop. Soda pop. Exactly. If I'm not mistaken, uh, when Coca-Cola first came out for the first 10 years, it had a very unusual ingredient in it. Yeah, I have heard rumors of that. Cocaine. Okay. It's the real deal. Yeah. Now, Scott, why do you have this old pie tin? Well, everything in the museum has a story. Mm -hmm. This one was no exception. This is a pie tin from the Frisbee Pie Company, which was in Connecticut, and nearby was a university where the kids like to eat the pies and then throw them. Somebody saw this and a little light bulb went off, changed the I in this Frisbee to an E, and thus you had the Frisbee. frisbee. So Scott, you told me that as a retired school teacher, you love to amuse your students and you have a very amusing item from the earliest days of onstage foolery. In fact, the whole genre was named after this device and that is a slapstick. Slapstick comedy. Yeah, come on over, Dennis! There you go. Normally it would just be a stick with another stick on a hinge, and you'd get a slap for a sound effect. This one is special because it has a place you can insert a blank cartridge, and then you would take it. Wow, so if you heard a gunshot or a slap on stage, it was probably this. Yes. In fact, you know what? Let's, let's test this out, Denise. I, I want you to slap me, okay? You, get, you ready? <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, right. One, two, three. <laughs> Denise, how do you find that this hobby keeps you vibrant and energized? Well, studies have shown that the people who are active after uh, retirement live longer. So this is definitely keeping us busy. <laughs> So you said that this hobby really is about the people you meet along the way more than the collections. How so? Well, I mean, obviously we have a lot of stuff here, but the stuff is linked to memories of people that we purchased it from or traded or whatever. And those memories are better than the object itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, it has more meaning to it and I look at it and I think of those people who were very good to me even when I was 16 and just starting. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you bringing me and us up here to see all this. Really appreciate it. About a century ago, a reporter asked Thomas Edison how it felt to have failed a thousand times before he invented the light bulb. Edison replied, I didn't fail. I found a thousand ways that won't work. Sometimes it's just the way we look at things that helps us determine whether or not we succeeded or failed. See, I think if we have a passion for something, the way that Edison had with his inventions and the way Scott and Denise Corbett have for their collections, then man oh man, we have succeeded. Our minds are buzzing with ideas and we wake up filled with energy. That's my light bulb moment. Thanks for joining me. That's class.
For more information on the Antique Phonograph Society, visit antiquephono.org. <laughs>